It is? Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm good. I just want to make sure we're good. All right. Well, like the slide here is saying, my name is Amber Moore. Thank you, Deborah, for in the introduction. I am the Riverwoods Field Lab Manager, um, and I am through the Center of Environmental Studies at FAU, who has a partnership with South Florida Water Management uh, to manage and do education and outreach at the Riverwoods Field Lab, and all based on the Kissimmee River and the restoration. There. Uh, so what I would like to kind of discuss today is uh, a little bit about before channelization on the Kissimmee River, why it was channelized, um, during channelization, the impacts that were uh, inflicted on it, and the reason for the restoration, and also headwaters revitalization, and the, evaluating the restoration itself. Um, and for those who are not familiar, you all probably know where the Kissimmee River is, but in case you don't, this map here shows you uh, Lake Kissimmee and Lake Okeechobee, and the river flows between it. And this red line on the map is showing us the water shed for the entire South Florida. So if you can see up there, Orlando, we're actually feeding this Kissimmee River and Lake Okeechobee and considered the Northern Everglades. Um, so very crucial what happens up here uh, because it does feed on down all the way down to the Keys and, and whatnot. Um, so this is all part of one watershed, which is an important piece to all of us. So historically, the Kissimmee River was a 103 mile long meandering river. And in the wet season, it would inundate into its floodplain. Uh, the floodplain was one to three miles wide. And, and during the wet, winter time, which was our dry season, it would recede, the waters would recede back down into the river channel. And this picture here is kind of in the middle, but you can see sandbars. This is a historical picture of, of the river. Um, this is pre-channelization. So that's the natural ecosystem with mostly broadleaf marsh and wet prairie grasses. Um, I believe this picture was in 1950s. Uh, I can't quote for sure. Uh, I just know it's pre-channelization. So there was uh, economic and development and growth in Central Florida during the 1940s that led to problems with flooding around the Headwaters Lakes, which again was the Orlando Kissimmee, Lake Kissimmee being the base of the Headwaters. Um, so there was cry for channelization of the Kissimmee River for flood control. And Congress passed and authorized in 1954 to do so. And this is in a picture, again, um, this is in the city of Kissimmee. You can see the flooding from, this is, that picture I know is from 1948. And then the next slide will show a couple more. Again, this is the, the city of Kissimmee during 1948 after uh, some hurricanes, I believe it was Hurricane David, but don't quote me on that, uh, that flooded the towns. And again, this is the cry, this was the reasoning we needed flood control. So channelization happens. Army Corps of Engineers came through and dredged a 56 mile long canal called the C-38 and it ran from Lake Kissimmee down to Lake Okeechobee. And uh, if you remember the original picture, historical picture, the, the river was a meandering river, the, the, the the canal just dissected it right down the middle. They didn't fill in the remnants. They just dissected right down the middle in a canal. We all know what a canal can do. It does it. It, 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 it does create flood control. It sucks that water into the canal. So the picture on, the, on your left is uh, the survey crew getting ready to survey for the canal. And then the 
picture on the right is the pictures of it actually being dredged. And, and I'm not sure exactly when this picture was taken because I don't know at what point, but it was somewhere between 1962 and 1971, which is when how long the dredging took. It took nine years to dredge. Um, again, because that was a 56 mile long, 300 foot wide, 30 foot deep canal. It's a big canal. So the impacts from that, flood control was successful. And again, this was public's outcry, Army Corps answered, we got this, we know how to do, we know how to do that. Um, so it was successful. It did dry out the land. Unfortunately, it did dry out the land. Um, so there was significant damage to the river and floodplain wet, wetland ecosystems. Uh, this picture here is of the cattle because that was the floodplain. Those are the cattle on the floodplain that is no longer there because of the canal. Also, this picture here is the remnant river channel. So remember I said the, the canal dissected right down the middle. Well, that cut off the flow of the water in those remnant channels. They were almost like mud puddles sitting off to the side. And with that came, uh, you can see the vegetation growing over the top, those floating tussocks. It was like a carpet and it blocked the sunlight, um, which then dropped the oxygen levels in the water, um, which then affects your fish and then also your, your waterfowl and your wading bird populations. Because again, we were in cattle fields and a mud puddle. Uh, so there's no, there's no invertebrates. There's, you know, the fish are very few. Um, so it affected the entire ecosystem. But we had some good things happen. I mean, these are all found in those cattle fields. Um, these are all endemic. And you're, I'm assuming you all know these birds. Does everybody recognize the grasshopper sparrow over there? Yeah, it's out there. Um, sand hill cranes, the burrowing owls, go owls, woo -woo, sorry. And the caracara, the crested caracara. Um, again, that is what was there during channelization because the lands were dry. But unfortunately, that is not the type of ecosystem that should have been there. Um, so there, there were pluses. Um, as I go forward, we'll talk about you know the restoration which is restoring those those wetlands so there was a lot of hurdles that had to be uh dealt with because these birds were there uh so here we move into yay Kissimmee river restoration project all right so remember i said dredging went from 1962 to 1971 well because of the effects of that channelization and the public realizing already the, the impacts that were happening to the environment. By 1976, we had the Kissimmee River Restoration Act in place. That's five years after they finished the nine years of dredging. We are already saying, how are we gonna fix this? So in 1994, the project cooperation between South Florida Water Management District for flood control and the Army Corps um, went into a 50-50 cost share. Now, South Florida Water Management District, not to be confused with Southwest, South Florida Water Management District is responsible for ecological monitoring and real estate, so land acquisition then Army Corps is responsible for all the construction. Uh, turn, turn dirt, so the first pilot project started in 1999. Okay, again, we started back in 1976 with the act and we are not pushing dirt until 1999. Then it took 22 years for the construction, so the Army Corps part, the construction to be complete, which was completed in the summer of 2021. Um, and we say construction, restoration's not complete. There's more pieces to it. I'll get to that. Uh, so, but but we do say construction is complete. Um, it was a huge undertaking that was 
I'll probably get into more detail with that in a second. So just know that. Um, and then also I keep talking this little headwaters revitalization. It's a little bit newer piece to it. Have any of you heard of that yet? Okay, so what that is is the hydrology and basically the water storage to keep this system flowing because it is a natural flowing system. And that's part of this ecosystem is the water flows through the river. So we need that water up, up top, the upper chain of lakes to, to feed that system. And there's been a lot of land development since then. So headwaters revitalization is that, that piece. And I'll get more into it here in a little bit. Then South Florida Water Management is responsible for the ecological monitoring. So there's at least another five years after the restoration project is complete to do ecological monitoring to make sure what they have done is good and have a good regulatory schedule going forward. Um, and let's see. So what was this project? Okay. They had to acquire 110,000 acres of land. Now they, meaning South Florida Water Management, because those cattle fields had moved in, people had moved in their houses. There's, thankfully, there wasn't a ton of houses. This is a very rural area to be able to do this. Um, you know, this is one of the world's largest restoration, river restoration projects. And it would not have been successful if it was in a metropolitan area. Um, it has re-established 40,000 acres of wetland habitat. Uh, they have backfilled 22 miles of canal. Now, the reason for only 22, remember I said there was 56 to begin with. The 52 is because we still need flood control. So the, re the restoration area is in, 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 the, in the map. You can see the, I'm guessing that's a tannish color down the middle. Um, that is the 22 miles of, of restoration. So 22 miles of backfill and that 22 miles created 44 miles of meandering river. So for every one, we got two miles of uh, reestablished flow. There was two water control structures removed, two out of the six that were originally installed. So there's still two at the top and two at the bottom and the two in the middle were removed. And that again is for flood control. We still, still have houses above and we still have houses below. So we still have to have flood control. Um, they are they dredged nine miles of new river channel uh, just because of more for engineering purposes uh, to make sure things didn't wash out. But for the most part, the the river channel will with flow uh, shift over time a little bit and we will let it do its thing because it's within that that one to three mile uh, valley of floodplain, so we're all good. We're gonna keep it going the way she's going. Um, and again, it was all for maintaining flood control that only 22 out of the 56 was completed. Now, sounds like a lot of work. It's a lot of money over a lot of time. We The land acquisition was happening during our, our boom, you know, back in 2004, 2005, I believe it was, there, we had that economic boom here, just kind of like during the pandemic when when real estate went out, but they should be buying more land now. Why not? <laughs> just kidding. Um, so the cost of this, this project to date is almost a billion dollars. Uh, all right. So headwaters revitalization is what is that last key that has not been completed yet and that's slated for another another few years, and I say few, I can't give you an exact because it, it keeps shifting. But again, that is for the hydrology and the water storage to have the hydrology right. Right now, all the backfilling has been completed. So, you know, the, the theory is you give it water and it will do its thing, um, but you have to give it the water at the right time, at the right quantities. This entire system is a low driven system. So what, what I mean by that is here in this picture, you can see the water is on the, you know, in the banks and doesn't really look like it's out into the floodplain. And if, if we get to 
1400 CFS, which is cubic feet per second coming out of the, the lock at the top, that's what we consider bank full. So the water level will come up and flow into the, the floodplain. Anything below that, it's down into the river channel, like that historical picture where there were sandbars, that was below that 1400 CFS, even though back then they didn't have something monitoring that. Um, but in today's terms, if, if we see something under 1400 CFFs, we know it, the water level is down inside the river channel and anything above 1400, it's out into the floodplain. Um, right now, that's about where we are. So it's just into the floodplain. There's water out there going right now. Um, last year, we got struck by Hurricane Ian. And uh, after Ian, we were at about seven or 8,000 CFFs. Um, and that was considered a hundred year storm for us. And the water levels were all the way to the hundred year flood line um, on both sides of the floodplain. So we were pretty full. Um, but again, this is, this is flow driven. So it's not necessarily rain driven though. Rain is what gives you water to give flow. So if you think about the water needs to come from Orlando, Kissimmee, that upper chain of lakes. So the rain needs to come from up there to feed the system. And there's a lot more people using a lot more water and the land has been developed a lot more around these lakes. So what Headwaters Revitalization is doing is buying back a little bit of land around three of the lakes to the north, which is Lake Kissimmee, Lake Cypress and Lake Toho. Um, and that is for water storage. And they're going to buy back a foot and a half is the plan of elevation stage so that we can store a foot and a half more in those three lakes to help feed the system. So it's not so flashy because if we get this rain that we're having right now in Orlando and you have to dump it because you, the flood control here and it gets dumped into the system. Well, that's a very flashy system then, you know, they're pushing it through the, the gates fast. So we don't want that because it's not good for the, the, the ecosystem. That's not used to that flashiness. But then if the, you're in a drought, they may shut the water off. So, you know, there, this, this water storage will help maintain a, a less flashy, a little more stable, you know, flow and discharge uh, releases for the system. So here's a picture of the backfill. So if you see how that straight line down the middle, that is the old C38 that's been backfilled. And up in the left hand corner, you can kind of see the spoil, you know, the, the dirt. That's where when they were dredging, they simply dredged and put the spoil into a berm right beside the canal. So for the majority of this project, they didn't have to haul in dirt. They just pushed it back into the, the canal and filled it in. And, and remember I said that they did not fill in the remnants. So once this canal was filled in, it pushed the water back into the remnant channels. If you, you can see off to the left, that squiggly channel. So flows going back through and it clears out all that vegetation, all that uh, detritus that's building up underneath, um, you know, the muck. Uh, so it's changing that system back to that flowing system that we want to see. Uh, so you can see here, I have uh, pointed out there, there's the remnant channel. We call the, where the canal dissects the, the old river uh, channel, we call those connectors where they, they've left it open so it can connect across there. Um, and then there's the spoil degrade areas uh, that where they just simply push the, ber the, the berm back into the canal. So, mm, there was almost a billion dollars spent on this project so far. We got to be able to say that's that's taxpayers' money. So we got to be able to say that what we're doing is working. And how do you do that? Restoration expectations. So there were expectations that were decided before the project even started. These were our targets of we need to reach these goals, these expectations to be able to say that what we're doing is successful. 
Now they started out with 60 something ideas and they narrowed it down to 26. And they're all related directly to saying that the, the environment has been changed back to a wetland prairie grasses and broadleaf marsh and flowing, uh oh, oh yeah, I'm on the right one, sorry. <laughs> and flowing river system. Um, so what, is, what are all the, those expectations? They involve hydrology. That's where I was talking about the headwaters, you know, getting that flow, the timing, the quantities, right. Um, the geomorphology. So the shifting of that river channel over time. Now with flow, it's going to etch out, you know, the outer banks and then deposit that, that sand on the inner banks, creating sandbars. You know, the sandbars are an important ecosystem for, for that particular uh, river. Water quality, vegetation, you know, we want to, again, see wet prairie grasses and broadleaf marsh for the majority of, of this, this system. Um, that's what it was. So if you see this picture, in the, the one in the background, that's, that's the kind of floodplain we want to see there. Um, Reptile and amphibians, you know, we want to have the right types of reptiles and amphibians out there. Fish, there's tons of fish, but there's only a particular kind that should be in this particular kind of ecosystem. And those are the ones we're looking at. We're looking at the populations and the biodiversity of those particular ones. So largemouth bass, sunfishes, um, we want to get away from the catfish, which is what was there during channelization. Catfish can enjoy low oxygen waters. The bass and the sunfishes don't enjoy that. So those are the things we're looking at. Um, and then birds. That's what we're all here for, right? <laughs> birds. We want to see the wading birds and the water birds, um, the waterfowl. We, we don't want to see... We love to see the sand hills and the care, well, care care we, we want out there too, but uh, the, gra the grasshopper sparrow, um, we love to see them, but not in this particular ecosystem. So responses that we've had so far, uh, again, we are now getting continuous flow in the river channel. Uh, there's replacement of the organic deposits. So those vegetation, floating vegetation mats across the river channel were dropping their leaves, creating that muck. Those are going away and they're being replaced with uh, with sand, sandy bottom. Uh, the formation of the sandbars, like I was talking about, those are an important piece of this environment. The increase in the oxygen levels in the water, again, that, that affects the fish um, and the types of invertebrates that, that are in the, in the water system. Um, the reduction of the vegetation in the, when, when I say littoral vegetation, that's in the river channel. So it was that thick growing stuff. We don't want that. We want it to kind of clear out and be, you know, a nice sandy bottom. We're also seeing colonization by natural wetland vegetation on the floodplain. Now this picture right here, if you see it's sandy, this is the backfill area and it's coming back to life um i believe this picture was in 2020 and this area had just been backfilled um under a year ago so so you can see the vegetation already starting to come back and of course it's is creating the habitat for the invertebrates and then what do the invertebrates bring back the birds So then we also have an increased density of wading birds on the restored floodplain. And this is a picture out there. This is not photoshopped. <laughs> and another one, just because we like birds. <laughs> so here's some other birds that we're beginning to see again. Um, can anyone I identify the, the little ones on the in the water? It's kind of a hard picture. Or lesser legs, or yellow, yellow, lesser yellow legs. Now that it's really hard for me to tell the difference between the two. The only way I can tell the difference is if I can hear them. 
with the difference in the, the peak and the greater and the lessers. Uh, we have the great egret, blue heron. Again, these are all pictures coming from out there. Now, the the lesser yellow, yellow lesser yellow, like, sorry. Um, those wouldn't be there if the system was not restored. Remember, this was a choked up river channel with upland cattle fields with cattle egrets running around everywhere, hanging out with the cows. Here's some more birds that we see. Oh, and I accidentally put in a sound effect for you on that one. What's this, wh wh what bird is calling right now? The Galinu. And there's the Lumpkin. We've got plenty of snowies. Snowies are all over the place. Lumpkins are too, of course. Um, and that is a, a black crested night heron hanging out with the alligator. Is that a yellow? Oh, my bad. I should have looked closer. And these guys. These guys are coming in huge numbers. Um, not seeing them right now. They're down in South America, but they are they are congregating getting when when it comes time to to head south they're starting to congregate here um i'm sure you've all know paul gray uh paul has always talked about how they they all go to fish eating creek before they head over i think they're going to start coming to the kissimmee river because they're in huge numbers now which is awesome and this guy Okay, we have not had one of these in 60 years. Does any, do some of you not know what this is? It's a snail kite or Everglades kite, also known as. And we have a huge number of these. Um, Tampa, so I'll do my shameless plug at the end, but also uh, Tampa Audubon Society came out last spring for our pontoon eco tour and they counted 56 snail kites on one boat trip. And we're hoping to get you guys out there and we're gonna co create a little competition see if you can count more. <laughs> so snail kites, okay, so some of you don't know what a snail kite is, which awesome because now I'm going to tell you and go into a little bit more about this why it's so important that this this bird is here um this is a female on her nest and then here we have some chicks and the reason why these guys are so important is they are an endangered species due to habitat loss and their habitat is wetlands and because they only eat apple snails, that is their sole diet. And if you don't have wetlands for the aquatic invertebrate apple snail, you do not have a food source for the snail kite. We have apple snails. Um, these pictures here, you can see the snail kite is carrying one. And then down on the left is the remnants of its lunch. And then to the right is eggs. Now these, unfortunately, if some of you who may know the difference, those are the invasive ones. Unfortunately, right now, we only have the invasive ones out there. Um, we're hoping to get the natives to come. Uh, typically natives take a little bit longer to, to move. Um, and these are snails, so they're not gonna move real fast. But they, but the, the exotics are still feeding the snail kite. So, I mean, it's a catch 22. We'll, we'll keep the McDonald's as long as they're coming to eat. Um, and this, this slide here just kind of shows you the difference between the two. The, the one to the right is the exotic. The one to the left is the native. And um, so a quick, since some of you don't know about snail kites, maybe you don't know about apple snails and native and exotics. When the exotics started to take over, of course, again, the snail kite is an endangered species. So 
it has been studied out the wazoo and it's including its diet. So when the exotics started to come in, we had this concern because of the size difference. So the pitcher in the middle up top, the big one is the exotic, the little one is the native. That's the size difference. There was concern that the, the snail kite wasn't gonna be able to get into that bigger snail um, to get to, to the food source. And research showed within 10 years, its beak, its bill adapted to be able to get into the, the exotic. So again, we'll take the exotic for now. Hopefully someday we'll get the natives to come in, but at least we're feeding an endangered species and giving it a habitat. Uh, algae. They're they're an aquatic invertebrate, so they're they're filter feeders. All right. Um. So a little bit more on exotics. Here's you know a swamp marsh hen. Uh, the first sighting that we we'd had, and it was in 2020. Um, there hasn't been a ton of a sight of those sighted out there, so that's kind of a good thing. Um. I mean, again, we do have exotics, they're gonna be out there. That's gonna be an issue. Uh, we just have to work with it. Now this area, this is, this again, this is what we wanna see um, out there. This is what we would consider broadleaf, uh, this plant specifically. Uh, again, we don't wanna see a monoculture, but this picture just happened to be of a nice little example of it. Uh, the you know this is what we want to see out there, and here comes my shameless plug. So again, reminder: I'm with FAU, and we have a partnership with South Florida Water Management to manage the facility, the research lab, but also for education and outreach. So a big part of our education and outreach is coming to, and doing things like this. But also we have a, a pontoon boat that we take people out on eco tours. Um, we take students out. We, we do from elementary on up to, we go from diaper to diaper. Let's just put it that way. And so, um, with the stu with the, with the, the kids, we like to take them out and do dip netting and, um, they get to learn about the different types of you know, catch fish and the bugs and get muddy, but also learn about the ecosystem. Um, we have groups coming internationally. Uh, and again, so we are kind of located right in the middle of the river in Lorita, Florida. Um, it's just about 20 minutes north of the town of Okeechobee, uh, 30 minutes south of the Sebring, give you a perspective. Also, we're starting out. Um, or revamping our kayak and canoe program. So uh, you'll be able to go kayaking or canoeing down the river. Uh, the river, the entire restoration area is um, open to all kinds of recreational use. Um, there are the air boaters, unfortunately, um, but there's also, you know, outboard, you can go fishing. Um, you, can, you can do the kayaking and go bird watching. There's so many birds out there on that floodplain. Um, we hear jet skis because it's a meandering river. It's, I think they enjoy that one a lot now. But for us through CES and FAU, we do the eco tour. So we take groups out um, and go for a tour. I give a quick little presentation within our visitor center, which is the picture up in the left corner. Um, and that's about it. Yeah, question? Go ahead. Snail kites? Um, there is research showing that, yeah, they, they do tend to eat um, vegetation. We've got a plant. We've got plenty of vegetation. So if they want to come eat, it's okay. Yes. How do the uh, Chattanooga? Exactly. So 
that's 40,000 acres of wetland habitat. And what is an STA usually made of? Plants, because plants are the best filtration system possible. So if you think about 40,000 acres of plant, wetland plants filtering that water like mother nature intended it to do, um, we're doing a big part. We're doing more than some of these STAs are doing. And if you don't know what an STA is, that's a storm, storm treatment area, storm water treatment area. Yes. So on the area Oh, good question. I didn't cover that. So the only place that any vegetation was replanted was, remember the those connectors I showed you? Um, a handful of those connectors, they right on the bank so that with the restored flow until the vegetation took time to, to grow in on its own, um, they planted some plants to help keep the erosion uh, at bay. So the entire 22 miles of 30 feet or 300 feet wide, that grew in on its own. And it grew in within one, one year. You could see it went from bare soil to vegetation over it. Um, like that picture I showed you with, with the uh, ibis and the, I think there were some roseates in the picture on that had a little bit of soil showing, but then there was plants growing. That was less than a year after backfill and it was already growing in. So there was just a very, very few plants planted. Um, and I, when I say very few, I'm talking less than 400 meters of plants planted in what was that 22 miles of backfill? Yes. Mm -hmm. So it it's it's the the lakes that are already there. It's just being able being allowed to raise the stage level in that lake a little bit higher. Um, so if you think about if if Florida is very flat, so to go one and a half feet up, you're going to go out pretty far with the slope. Uh, so all it's doing is being able to we. Water management has regulations on where they're allowed to have water levels. And so all headwaters revitalization is, is raising that, that level, that, that maximum level, a foot and a half. Yes? Have they already required, district already acquired that land to accomplish all the other um, I'm not positive if all the land has been purchased that's all been in the works in the last few years and it, and and their ideas and their have shifted they've shifted a little bit um i did reach out to water management um this week just to ask hey where are we what what are we legally saying now as our target um but i did not ask if all the real estate has been purchased um i do know that they are planning the first increment and I don't know what they're considering because again, they the, the plan has shifted back and forth and it was supposed to be um, three increments of six inches. So they were gonna start with one six inch increment, go to two, go to three. I wasn't give, given a clear answer of where we are right now other than well, increment one will be Im implemented in uh, the end of 2024 going into 2025. So that's what a, a, another year out. So a year from now, they're going to, they're going to have the first um, increment done. So why, and I'm not sure why they decided to go in increments instead of saying, okay, well, let's just buy the land back and go with it. Um, other than maybe there's some ecological portion to it that they want to monitor because you're now raising a lake level, which all that littoral vegetation is going to be affected. Um, and they, they may be wanting to, you know, do it in a slower pace. Um, 
don't quote me on this. I, I've been trying to get some hardcore answers, but they're they're a little shifty right now on that. But as of the real estate part, I don't know if it's all been bought back yet or not. Um, mo there's a few houses on Lake Kissimmee, um, Lake Cypress. There's there's not a ton of houses around those three lakes. Um, and the reason they did those three is, again, Lake Kissimmee is what goes directly into uh, the Kissimmee River. But then uh, Cypress and Toho are attached or without a water control structure between the three lakes. So they're using those three. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, yeah, you can still, you can still navigate from um, Lake Kissimmee all the way down to Lake Okeechobee. You have another question? Yeah. Um, Yeah, there's there's definitely already regulations put in place of where how far you can develop. Um, just like with with the Kissimmee River restoration itself, uh, they had to buy back a lot of land, and then and and they have purchased all the land that was up to the five year flood lane line. Sorry, and then there's the hundred year flood line that. They try to purchase back, but if a if a property owner didn't want to sell, we say okay. But there are rules that you can't build in it. You can't have a septic there. You know, there's there's things that you cannot do. It may be yours, but it's going to flood. Um, we can't provide, and I say we mean water management can't provide flood control promises in those areas. So. If it hasn't been developed yet, I can guarantee you it won't be developed within that foot and a half lake stage. That yeah, this this is the rev the headwaters revitalization has been in the talks and been in the works for many many years, um, and it was just that last piece of the puzzle. They they needed to you know with funding, but they needed to to work and focus on the the construction part of the the river before they got to the headwaters. Say that. There's the wildlife corridor. Um, the, so there's the Kissimmee River restoration area is um, a restaurant. It's not a it's not a wildlife. Um, no, but it is considered the northern Everglades. And I do know um, DeSantis was has pushed some funding for more protection up that way. Um, yes. Did the EP have a role with it? The EPA? D -E oh, DEP, sorry. Um, they, they are not part of the restoration project, but they were involved with, um, during the restoration, during the construction, um, Especially like with the bird, those those uh, prairie birds that I I mentioned, um, but also with water clarity, with you know making sure um, the contractors were putting up the silt fences when they're when they're pushing so that we're not polluting the waters downstream. Um, I keep saying we like I I did all this. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been involved with this project since 2006. So I feel like it's my baby. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I mean, they, they weren't necessarily part of the, the main restoration project, but they are going to have 
um, they're going to say, oh, you're going to do this. You need to pull a permit and we need to be monitoring this and you can't do this until that's done. Um, just like FWC also, um, there was there was some issues down at the at the bottom end um, in the last phase of backfill because there are some oak trees that had grown in. You're talking 60 years of being able to grow. Oak tree gets pretty big in 60 years. Um, and there was a bat they were concerned about, um, possibly habitating, habitating and, you know, living in these, these oaks. So we had to go through, not we, uh, <laughs> I was involved though. I, again, cause I did, I did do a lot of the ecological monitoring until the past two years. Um, and then I was promoted to Riverwoods manager. So we does invo involve me. <laughs> But um, we had to go monitor to make sure and do back call surveys uh, to ensure that they weren't actually living inside these oaks before they got torn down. I thought I saw another hand. Yes. Well, I mean, the, the jet skis are going to stay in the river channel. They're not going to go out into the floodplain. Um, they're on that river channel because it's it's a meandering. It's it's. There's very limited boat uh, ramps, so it it takes a you know, it. You know how we limit the boat the outboards is during low water because it gets shallow. So they, they're not going. Um, but there's there's not very many access points. Um, water management is trying to work on a few extras, but not there's not a ton. There's um, So within the restoration area itself, uh, you have the Istapoga boat, uh, Istapoga canal boat ramp, and you can, kind of claim the the s65 d which is the the bottom lock the bottom structure of the, the restored section has a, a boat ramp um and then there's two airboat launches but also at the airboat one of the airboat launches is right next to the river channel and there's you can also launch um canoes and kayaks from that point um, but that's really the only designated boat ramps within the restored section. And again, it's 44 miles of meandering river channel that has been restored. So it's a, you know, that's 22 miles from top to bottom as a crow flies, but um, it's, there's not a lot of access points that people do paddle from like uh, highway 60 and go all the way through. Yes. I'm pretty sure it brought the lake levels up to the 60 foot elevation and tied those systems and all of that to the right there. Does the system, the revitalization, and what you're saying in the river, they were to, that would have probably been met that high water level we're hoping to get throughout the year, flooding into the channel to easily in channel water in the river. So, so when Ian, when Ian took effect, um, headwaters had not been implemented yet. So it's that it's not slated to start until next year. Um, so, and, and again, I don't know all the details of what's involved with the real estate and, you know, the, the removal of things or whatever. Um, but that was, that was an extreme storm event that, um, you know, there was flooding everywhere. And so, it 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 did not go out of the hundred year flood line. So, mm -hmm. the and when and when I say five year or hundred year flood line, I'm referring to. A five year, what we consider a rainfall event that is considered only going to happen every five years versus a storm, a rainfall event that's going to happen every hundred years. So there's a five year flood line and a hundred year flood line. And 
the water in within the restored area did not go outside that hundred year flood line. Um, and the reason I know this, <laughs> the visitor center at Riverwoods um, is that was a neighborhood. So Riverwoods Field Lab was a neighborhood that water management had to buy back because it was within that flood line. Now the visitor center and a couple other buildings are outside that hundred year flood line, but water management decided just to buy back that whole little neighborhood. It was about 18 acres. Um, and all the houses that were inside the hundred year flood line were torn down. The septics were pulled out. It's, you know, it's just vacant land now. Um, but the visitor center was right on that hundred year line. And we actually had to uh, redo the septic so that it was outside that hundred year line. And that water from Ian came within 15 feet of that house. So it was, like I said, you know, I, I didn't, I couldn't draw my finger on where exactly that hundred year line is, but I knew the general vicinity of it. And it was right in that you could see perfect hundred year storm line. So it did not go outside of that. Did I answer? Mm, that I don't know, to be honest with you. So, I mean, it's the entire restoration project itself that that those boundaries, that's all owned by South Florida Water Management. And that is open to the public for all recreational use. Um, parks, I'm not sure what the plans are for additional parks, um, but I mean, that's that's already open. Great question. We really enjoyed it. And I do want to say before we cut is that um, we do have a trip scheduled on Dotted on Dive. And uh, I have people attending a meeting that got in on it. It's it, 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 not going to be 15, right? Yeah. So, and I have a list of 15 already. So, the list is shown in the voice. So, Barb, if anybody wants to be on the wait list, just pop in the email and say, I'm going to be on the wait list. I'm not going yeah, and we could schedule we could schedule a second trip um and then also what i'm i know for i don't want to like overstep your bounds but so typically it the way our program's running right now it's scheduled tours um i'm hoping by springtime um to offer maybe once a month a pay per person on a you know like a a friday or a saturday once a month a set one. Um, that's something I'm I'm working towards, uh, trying to get that sorted out. Um, but that'll also be an option look going forward. So if you you know just pay attention to our our website, that I'll have more information coming up. The QR code will pull you to our website also. Yes. Yeah, a floating dock. So a wheelchair behind. Oh yeah. I had to ask. Well. So we don't even have a dock at Riverwoods. Okay. Um, we have one down at Pierce Locket, which is, and that's a privately owned um, facility that is a historical homestead that uh, they they allow us to dock there now. So I I will start looking into how to make it more accessible. Um, okay, all right. Um, Mount Dora. Rusty anchor to Okay. Okay. I I appreciate the information because that is something I I do want to start looking into. We're we're very small funded program, so um, I'm trying to trying to build it. Um, my predecessor started this program in in the the late '90s, um, but and she retired, which is why I'm where I am now. So, yes.
Um, if you want to do, if you want to do a kayak, um, you could do four E's boat ramp, which is like less than a mile South of Riverwoods, or you could go out, um, the Isapoga canal boat ramp with the, both of those are on highway 98. Um, I would, if you start from like 60, it's a long ways down the canal before you get to the river. So, and there's a, there's an unofficial boat launch, uh, where the, the highway 98 bridge goes over the river. Um, people pull over right there, but there, there are campsites along there. So four East just opened and water management just opened a four East campsite. Um, there are some campsites along the river channel. They're all new. Um, water management has been working this past year on adding in a couple extra campsites that are right on the river. Um, the Kissimmee Prairie State Park, I, you, it's, that's pretty far from the actual river channel, but, it, but that's right at the top also. Um, of the restoration area. Um, I don't know about launching a kayak up there though, but yeah, that, I mean, that's part of, of the, the system, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, for all of you that came tonight, we want to thank you. And we have some free suet packets at the back. Help yourself. Everyone grab one, maybe, maybe even two. <laughs>